uh, uh, Catherine and Peter. This could be any one of you. Several years ago, Peter was a little bit clumsy. He was in his, was in his kitchen and dropped a glass unexpectedly. He thought nothing of it and simply got on with his life. Several weeks later, he stumbles and again doesn't think anything of it. He has a, a lingering numbness in one of his feet. But his partner, Catherine, insists that he goes to the doctor. So they go to the doctor and the doctor runs a few blood tests, thinks about it for a little while. A couple of days later, they come back, nothing unusual. Must have just been a virus. Come back again if you have any other problems. Several months go by and Peter hops out of bed and collapses. So he's lost the feeling in one of his feet. So back to the doctor, who immediately refers him to a neurologist. That appointment is set for six weeks' time, the earliest possible appointment. So Peter and Catherine now have six weeks of time to contemplate what this might be. You don't often get referred to a neurologist. So they set about Googling and having a look at what's available, what's come up when we look for numb feet, falling, clumsiness. Google always returns the worst things first and you end up with a whole list of potential uh, conditions which are responsible for these symptoms. Ataxia probably looks like the best option. We'll go with that. Um, at least there's an option for treatment. So the appointment day arrives and they basically sit down with the neurologist and commence a program of screening activities, essentially to eliminate every possible condition that might be responsible. From MRIs, blood tests, lumbar punctures, genetic testing, uh, the, the process continues. And eventually, ataxia is eliminated and a preliminary diagnosis of ALS is given. The doctor says, uh, essentially, things are improving. There are treatments arriving, um, but you'll need to start something straight away. So ALS, for those of you that don't know, is a progressive motor neurone disease, which begins in the extremities and gradually progresses through eventually resulting in the inability to eat, to speak or to breathe, whilst continuously having full consciousness of this process. Patients generally only live for about 27 months from diagnosis. There are longer conditions. Um, Professor Stephen Hawking lived for 55 years with the condition, but most pass away very shortly after diagnosis from complications of respiratory failure. There are some treatment options available, but they're not great. So I'll pause at that point and tell you a little bit about what we're doing. So Celosia Therapeutics is essentially developing life-changing genetic medicines for ALS patients. I'm Dr. Brenton Hamdorf, CEO of the company, and the company has arisen out of Sydney, Australia, at one of the universities and two research groups that have come from there. Whilst I'm not going into any details, we do cover a range of different potential treatments from Dravet syndrome, a childhood form of epilepsy, through to Alzheimer's disease, but due to time limitations, we're only going to focus on ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, as some of you may know. So why is there a need for treatments? There is a range of drugs that are already available for treating ALS. And Relvirio, or Relvirizol is the standard of care. It provides a three month life extension. Uh, if uh, Peter went on to Relvirio, which is the latest drug, he can expect a five month extension of life with his partner. So the drugs, whilst wonderful, are not brilliant and so there's enormous scope for improvement in those treatments. So a little bit about the science behind what we're doing. So our target is TDP43. It's known that mutations in that gene cause ALS, but not all TDPopathies are caused by a gene mutation. 90% of cases of ALS occur sporadically and only 10% of known genetic origin. Fortunately, TDP is found in 97% of patients. 
So in effect, we are tra treating or potentially aiming to treat both the sporadic and the, um, the genetic forms of ALS. So in a healthy motor neuron, TDP43 is located primarily in the nucleus where, it can, where it's involved in RNA shuttling. But it's a very tightly regulated protein, so you can't just increase or decrease that level without affecting the cell. In a motor neuron or a disease situation, you end up with a mislocalization of TDP43, forming aggregates within the cytoplasm. We also have depletion of T TDP43 from within the nucleus. So you have both a gain of function and loss of function uh, disease mechanisms involved in this disease. This is what it looks like from post-mortem tissue. There are no real diagnostics for, for ALS, um, but in post-mortem tissue, you can quite often observe those fibrils or aggregated protein there, which is TDP43. There are treatments that are being developed, and those treatments really do range from small molecules um, or broadly classified as small molecules, antibody treatments and degrader technologies. And so Solosia is using a degrader technology, but we have paired that with an AAV to, uh, to get the targeted delivery. In effect, uh, what we're terming a genetic protac. So these are the two therapeutic options that we're working with at the moment. Um, the first is a peptide therapeutic. It is tagged with a degradation domain, which recruits the E3 ligase. Then the whole complex is then degraded through the UPS system. The second approach is used as cyclin F. Cyclin F is a natural component of the E3 ligase, but has a whole range of other binding partners that it, that it binds to. What we've done is we've engineered out all of the other partners, so now it only binds TDP43 in its pathogenic form. It again recruits E3 ligase and then processes it through the UPS system, but different from the, the first example, only the TDP43 is degraded, not the whole complex. So this gives us a one-to-many option in terms of treating or clearing pathogenic forms of TDP43. I'm not going to touch on this in too much detail, only, but only because it's got a link back to um, ALS. So for our Alzheimer's and Dravet, we're really targeting excitotoxic pathways within, um, within neurons. And P38 MAP kinase is a, is, a, is a particular kinase which is only found in the post synapse. It's not found anywhere else in the body. And its role is to phosphorylate tau. And in doing so, it breaks that complex and prevents excitotoxicity. If you recall, Riluzole, the first line treatment and the standard of care um, for ALS also targets, or, or specifically here, targets glutamate and prevents glutamate release, and therefore prevents the excitotoxic pathway. So we're currently exploring this as our third line of treatment for ALS. The IP is really spread across a fairly broad range of patents. Uh, we've got three patent portfolios, uh, 31 patent applications, um, two are granted already in Japan, uh, and a fourth enabling technologies that we've just filed, which really covers some, a, a very clever molecular switch, which is disease regulated, and some surrogate biomarkers for ALS, because one of the features of ALS is there are no biomarkers. Um, neurofilament light is one, but it's also related to generally uh, aging as well, so it's not a great biomarker. So in the time that's remaining, I'll just quickly touch upon one of the additional technologies. So this is the, the regulation of gene expression. So long-term overexpression of genes is a problem. Um, if we're treating somebody in their 50s or 60s and they're going to live for another 20 years expressing this product, we don't know what the impact is until they've, they've expressed that for, for the 20 years. Um, and because the, the aim is to really manage the disease, not just overexpress a protein. So there are very, we had a search around and there are very few clinically available um, genetic switches or regulators that are available. And so we went about designing our own. So if you recall from the start of the presentation, as the disease progresses, cytoplasmic TDP43 increases in the cytoplasm and decreases in the nucleus, leading to neurodegeneration. Um, the aim in treating that is to basically reduce TDP43 within the cytoplasm 
and increase or restore nuclear TDP-43. Those changes in mechanisms act as a switch. And so as nuclear TDP-43 decreases and cytoplasmic um, TDP-43 increases, this switches on automatically our gene therapy. Once those signals change and you end up with cytoplasmic TDP-43 decreasing and nuclear TDP-43 increasing, it turns off again. And it does this dynamically throughout the disease progression um, and really providing us with uh, a disease-regulated molecular switch that requires no external induction. So the two researchers that are behind this are uh, found in Professor Lars Itner and Professor Roger Chung, based at two research centres within Macquarie University. And Professor Chung is the CSO for the company as well. So how is this going to help patients? So at the end of the day, um, the patients like Peter really are calling out for these types of technologies. So we have three novel gene therapy families. Um, and we've combined the benefits of an AAV with targeted protein degradation and built in a molecular switch into that system to dynamically regulate the, the treatment. So we're about to commence preclinical um, development of one of those therapies, in that case the peptide therapeutic um, that was the first that we've shown, which has a one-to-one -one ratio. So like Peter and many thousands of others, there is an increasing demand for these types of treatments. Their initial diagnosis took a long time, um, time that they won't get back. And we're, whilst we're not developing their diagnostics yet for these patients, we do hope that our genetic medicines will not only extend their life, but also their quality of life. So I thank the uh, organisers for the invitation to speak today and thank you for your attention. Um, welcome any uh, discussions after the event or during the next couple of days. Thank you.